gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter, or chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify by my, about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge me according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered them, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Just like a fungus, you came back. Now, I'm not actually referencing any of you, lest you take it personally. I'm specifically not referencing Bill Davis, who I saw earlier. No, I'm just simply commenting on one of the great insults of our day, which would somehow be applicable to the Pharisees in our story this morning. Because just like we pointed out last week, they came back. And sure enough, as much as Jesus caused them to leave, they're back again. They just keep coming back like a good fungus. Last week when we started in John chapter 8, we read the opening two verses where Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. Now I want you to consider for just a moment what happens next. You remember that the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery to Jesus. And you remember that their purpose was not to uphold the law, not to address sin and its remedy. Their purpose was to test Jesus or to trap him in their midst. Of course, Jesus being smarter and wiser than they, you remember he stooped down and wrote in the dirt. And at one point in time, he gave a response to them. He who has no sin may cast the first stone before stooping down again and riding in the dirt that was so powerful that it literally caused those religious leaders of the day to one by one leave. When they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the elder ones, and he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. The only two people left at least in talking distance, was Jesus and the woman. And, of course, Jesus tells the woman to go and sin no more. That's where we pick up with our lesson this morning. That is where we begin in verse 12, reading down through verse 20, and we take another snippet of information where immediately we are introduced to the Pharisees once again. They're back. They're back for another round. They don't like Jesus. They don't like what he's saying. They don't like what he stands for. And they are persistent. They are stubborn. They want to do all that they can to remove the obstacle of the Lord from their midst. And that's how he viewed them. So this morning we're going to take a look at one person in two different ways. And we're going to take a look at the testimony and judgment of the light. The testimony and the judgment of the light. Now if you take a look at that that particular uh, title, uh, it is not really three things so much as it is two things. We're going to be focusing this morning on the testimony and we're going to be focusing on the judgment. But because the word light, a word that in many of our translations is capitalized because it is referring to a person, is so significant, 
we're going to begin this morning by asking the question, who was or who is this light that we are reading about in John chapter 8? And I think, of course, you're going to know that answer. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, we read this statement. Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus introduces himself right off the bat as the light of the world. He is that light that we are referencing there in verse 12. But this is not the first time in this gospel account through which we are studying that Jesus is referred to as the proper noun light. That, of course, the gospel writer John does that right up front in John chapter 1 and verse 1 through 13. John very often used very unique descriptions for Jesus. He calls him the word representing the embodiment of the will of God. He calls him the light representing the purity and the embodiment of that goodness, of that perfectly good nature that can save us and would save us as a result of his sacrifice on the cross. John begins his gospel in John 1 and beginning in verse 1 by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now listen to what he says next in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. God, was John. His, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not receive him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John would say later, and we are not to this point in our study, but John would say in John chapter 9 and verse 5, he would quote Jesus who would declare, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This would continue in John 12 verses 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, for a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and he went away and hid himself with them. John chapter 12 and verse 46 reads, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Now for several of the students in my school of preaching, I just did something that I tell them routinely not to do. And that is not to just rifle through a bunch of verses without expounding upon them and without explaining their purpose. But every once in a while, there's a reason to do that. And that is to impress upon ourselves as we are in par taking a part of this lesson the idea that this is a term that John uses to describe Jesus this is a term that the Lord uses to describe himself over and over and over and over again in the text he is the light he represents the absence of darkness and when we think about light and dark, John would later talk about how we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. Uh, that's because we don't want to walk in darkness. Darkness typifies sin. And so we do not even want to put a foot into the area of darkness or into an area of sin. We want to flee from that sin. And we want to remain as pure as we possibly can. So we do want to walk in the light. We want to walk in the light of Jesus, something that Jesus refers to himself as actually being, the embodiment of purity and perfection, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could remove the sins of the world. 
So Jesus refers to himself as the light right off the bat. He describes himself as something that generally was associated with God only. And as many of the Pharisees did not believe Jesus to be God, you can understand the problem with him making such a declaration. Are you suggesting that you're God? Are you suggesting that you're perfect? Are you suggesting that you are greater than us or ultimately greater than our father Abraham? That's going to be part of the source of contention in the passage this morning. But let's get to the two main points that I want us to focus on. First and foremost, what was Jesus' testimony? Now I want you to remember what the answer was to the last one. And I want you to consider the answer to this one. It's the same thing. At least it's found in the same verse. The testimony that Jesus makes is once again in verse 12. And in verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. That is his testimony. It is his testimony that he is that excellence. He is that purity. He is the one who came from heaven. He is the one who has been sent by the Father. But he is the light. I want you to consider something that happens in John chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, the very next two verses in our passage this morning. The Pharisees say to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now, this is a point that we'll reference here in just a moment, but this is this idea that you cannot simply testify on behalf of yourself. Now, that's a he said, she said situation, and even in our courts of law today, we need more evidence than that. We need at least two people bearing witness to something. But let me hold off on that for just a moment. Because Jesus answers in verse 14 and says to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true for where I came from and where I'm going for I know where I came from and where I'm going but you do not know where I come from or where I am going now if you remember when we were in John chapter 6 and verse 38 Jesus declared where he had come from he said for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me let's go back for just a moment to this idea about him testifying about himself First of all, the accusation is being made by the Pharisees as if that is something wrong. And in a normal court of law, that would be the case. But do you remember Jesus' response? He says, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. Now, is that a violation of the law of Moses? Well, no. And let me explain. Turn in your Bibles for just a minute to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I want you to listen to what Jesus said three chapters ago that is almost identical except for one word. Jesus makes the statement in John 5 verse 31. He says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. And yet he just got through saying to us in John 8 and verse 14, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. The key distinction here is alone. Jesus was not violating the law of Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 6, also Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15, demonstrates to us that you had to have two or more witnesses in order to bear witness against someone, in order to, for an accusation of an offense to stick. But Jesus is saying, if I myself, I and I alone, if that was all we had, yes, that would be in violation of the law. But he also makes the statement, if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. Now, there's two reasons for this. First and foremost, he's God. He's God in the flesh. Whatever he says is true as God himself cannot lie. So if he bears witness, it is true. But he's not the only witness. You remember when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan? And we hear the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus was not the only one bearing witness. His Father was as well. I want you to continue with me in John chapter 5 and verse 32. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. 
You have sent John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. Now, this is not John, the writer of the gospel that we're talking about. This is John the baptizer. And John the baptizer did bear witness, did give his testimony as to the validity of the Christ. But Jesus makes the point here. He says, I'm not talking about any human being. I'm talking about one in heaven above who bears witness and is willing to testify on my behalf. And basically, if you can do good math, Jesus, the Son, plus God, the Father, that equals two. And that's who is bearing witness for him. In John 8, verses 17 and 18, those, uh, Jesus would say, Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So in other words, if you believe the Father, if you believe what he says to be true, if you believe what he says to be good and wholesome and pure, then you should recognize my testimony as well, since my testimony and his testimony are absolutely identical. What was Jesus' testimony? That he was indeed and is for us today the light of the world. He is the one who can dispel the darkness. He is the one who can show us the way. And he is the one who can lead us into the eternal light of the presence of God in heaven forever. Let's take a look at the second part of our lesson this morning. And that is by asking the question, what was Jesus' judgment? Now this is a little tricky as well because it's according to how we look at the word judgment. First and foremost, what was Jesus' judgment? Well, guess what? It once again comes from verse 12. The judgment is not about he himself or the fact that he is the light. Those are declarations of, and statements of fact. But the judgment deals with whether we choose to accept that fact or whether we choose to walk in the footsteps of the light of life. Jesus makes the statement, the one who follows me will not, will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now you can ultimately infer from that that the one who does not follow him will walk in the darkness and not have the light of life. So the idea is, it goes back to what the Bible teaches us from day one, there are two paths we can follow. We can follow the path of righteousness or unrighteousness. We can pursue godliness or ungodliness. We can, we can turn to the right or we can turn to the left. We can follow a, a road that is very difficult to travel that leads to eternal life or we can follow that wide way that leads to eternal destruction that most people are going to follow. Jesus is simply reiterating something that the scriptures have taught from the beginning, that we either follow God and are rewarded through his grace and mercy as a result, or we cannot follow God and get what we deserve, and that's eternal punishment cast out of his everlasting presence. Jesus makes this judgment, but I want you to notice something that is mentioned. In John chapter 7 and verse 24, just the last chapter, do you remember when Jesus made the statement, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment? Because of a situation that happened in my life just this last week where somebody was asking me some difficult questions, and so I asked that person a difficult question in return. And I asked the person a question, would you call a person who is engaged in such and such an activity, would you call that sin? Would you say that what they are doing is wrong? And the person responded and said, well, I don't want to judge. That's the problem that we have in our society today. Some people who do not understand scriptures, like Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, they have taken their lack of understanding, their misunderstanding, and they've hidden behind the idea that I can't make a judgment about anything. Brethren, when it comes to judging eternal salvation, when it comes to judging who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, that is not our place. That is God's place. He will do it, and he'll do it correctly. But 
when it comes to making decisions about what he has already decided, our judgment can be just. It's called righteous judgment. And all we're doing is teaching with our words and our actions what God has already deemed right versus wrong. The Bible talks all the time about how we need to call what is good, good, and call what is wrong, wrong. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. That's not a good thing. And we've got to recognize, despite the fact that it seems to be very politically incorrect, to call various sins, and and especially sins that are popular in our social culture today, We have got to call what is right, right, and what is wrong, wrong. And we don't need to be ashamed of it, and we don't need to be afraid of it. When Jesus made the statement, judge with righteous judgment, he is simply saying that we need to make judgments, we need to repeat judgments that God has already declared. But I want you to notice something that's very similar to that in John 8, verses 15 and 16. Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. And he's talking to those Pharisees, those folks who have come back for round next. He says to those Pharisees, you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. Now, Jesus was not there saying, I've never made a judgment of any kind. What he's saying is, I'm not judging anyone as you judge those people. I'm not judging with an earthly judgment, and my time is not yet to judge with that eternal judgment. Remember the woman caught in adultery. Was she wrong? Yes. Did she sin? Yes. Is adultery wrong? Yes. But what did he say? He said, if nobody else is here to condemn you according to the law of Moses, I will not condemn you either. But eternal judgment is his, and eternal judgment he will make. But this is Jesus in the flesh. This is Jesus humble before the Father and serving every single one of us. And he makes the statement, I'm not judging anyone. Not with that eternal judgment, not yet. And I'm certainly not judging like you judge with an earthly, selfish judgment. But look at verse 16. But even if I do judge, (laughs) my judgment is true. Now first and foremost, why? Because he's God. It's the same reason his testimony would be true. Because he's God. But the same reason that his testimony can be validated because he also has the testimony of the Father in agreement, he's saying the exact same thing here about his judgment. My judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and my Father who sent me. Turn back, if you will, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I want you to read with me two passages of Scripture, one that we've already read and one that we will read in weeks and months to come. But I want us to start in John chapter 3. Now, we know John chapter 3 because of verse 16. But we're going to begin in verse 17. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says regarding his role and judgment. In John 3, verses 17 through 21, Jesus said, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light comes into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. There are so many different aspects of this passage of Scripture that might be confusing if you look at everything in the exact same way. I want you to consider something. Verse 17 says, God did not send the Son in the world to judge the world, and yet that's exactly what Jesus is going to do on that last day. But this, what we are reading here in John 3, even this, what we are experiencing in life, this is not yet the judgment day. That has not yet come. Jesus did not come into the world to usher everyone immediately into judgment and give us all what we deserve. Jesus came to give us hope. Jesus came to give us the opportunity to be saved 
from our sins. In verse 18, it says, he who believes in him is not judged, meaning this is not that ultimate judgment of condemnation because in Christ is salvation. In Jesus is the opportunity to be saved, not condemned. So if I'm with Jesus, if I'm on his side, if I am covered in his blood and protected by his grace, then there is no condemnation for me. But he says, but to those people who do not believe, to those people who do not live by his will and, and walk in his footsteps, those people are judged, but they're judged not only in eternity, but unless they change, unless they demonstrate a penitent heart, they're judged right now because they have nothing to look forward to going forward now and into eternity except the hopelessness of being cast out of the presence of God. Jump forward ahead of our reading today to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and I want you to take a look with me at verses 46 through 50. John chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. John chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. Jesus said, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Now, once again, Jesus talks about, I did not come into the world to judge the world, but he demonstrates and he clarifies something by which each of us will be judged. And I want to really kind of do like I do sometimes, and I want to work backward to arrive at that point. First of all, look at verse 50. Look at that last verse. He says, I speak just as the Father has told me. In the same way that Jesus' testimony was that of the Father, in the same way that Jesus' judgment is that of the Father, here he says, the very words I speak are the words of the Father. He said in verse 40, I did not speak on my own initiative, but in essence, the Father gave me what I needed to declare, what to say and what to speak. And then I want you to look at the last part of verse 48. The word I spoke, that word of the Father, the word in which we are in agreement, the teachings that he has given us, the, the sermons that he delivered to us, the stories that he told us, the words I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. The very words of Jesus, which were consistent with the words of the Father, which is, in fact, all in one, the will of God, these are the things which will judge us. Perhaps it would not be fair, it would not be right, it would not be just if we did not know what the rules were, if we did not know what makes things right and what makes things wrong. This is what Paul said. He said, I wouldn't know how to... Uh, that, that covetousness was a sin, if not for in the Old Testament under the law of Moses, that commandment, thou shalt not covet. Well, we understand what is right today because of what Jesus has spoken. And we understand what is wrong because sin itself is defined as that which goes against the will of God. So what God tells us to do, if we don't do it, it's sin. What God tells us not to do, if we do it, it's sin. But this is based upon his will for our lives. It's based upon the word of God. And as we see specifically here, the teachings of Jesus. And so we either choose to listen to those words and put them into practice. We choose to listen to those words and not put them into practice. Or we choose to not listen to those words at all. But ignorance is no excuse. Because the words have been given. The secret has been revealed. The way of life has been told to us. And if we want to escape the consequences of our sinful choices, then we listen and we obey. I want you to consider what happens in the very last two verses of our reading this morning. 
they were saying to him, where is your father? Now, Jesus keeps referencing the father. Are we talking about his earthly father, Joseph? Are we talking about the Jewish father, Abraham? Or are we talking about the heavenly father, God? They were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, and he wasn't talking about Joseph, and he wasn't talking about Abraham. He said, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. You know, on another occasion, Jesus is asked, show us the father. And Jesus makes the statement, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Why? Because the two of us are one. We are one in testimony. We are one in judgment. We are one in the very words that are spoken. There is no uh, distinction. There is no difference. There is no contradiction. We are absolutely one. And that oneness has revealed to us a light that lights the pathway to eternal salvation. And the question very simply for us is, will we walk down that path? It's our choice to sin, and it's our choice to be saved. Now, God did not provide a way for us to sin. That's all on us. But God has provided a way of salvation because there is no way to be saved without him. There was no way to be saved without the gift of Jesus, that perfect sacrifice on the cross. There is no way to access the forgiveness of sins and the grace and mercy that God is willing to bestow upon his children as they walk faithfully for, to him without Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world and that life is within me, now perhaps we understand just a little bit better what he meant. The question is, will we be like a fungus? Will we be going back to sin? Will we be going back or will we make a decision that we will follow Jesus? And we're going to stick to that decision and we're going to stay on that path. Or will we do like a lot of people who make that decision and they're just kind of wishy-washy? It's like the ride in the roller coaster. It's sometimes how we describe the children of Israel of old. Will we be righteous in one moment and unrighteous in the next and just constantly work through our lives like that? Or are we going to understand what it means to be committed? And are we going to understand and appreciate and desire to step into the light and stay in that light as it illuminates our way to heaven? This morning, make that decision. If you're outside of Christ, friend, please understand, you're in darkness. You're not in that light. But if you will put on Christ in baptism and have those sins washed away, you will rise up a new creation in the light and the life of the Lord. If you are a child of God, where are you? Are you walking in the light as he is in the light? That's the only way that the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us of all sin. But if you have backslid, if you have gone back into the world, it's not too late. The reason I know this is you're still alive if you're hearing me, and Jesus hasn't come again. So while those two factors are in place, if you need to make a change, make it now. Make it before God in prayer with a penitent heart asking for forgiveness. And our God who is faithful will do just that. And if we can help you through prayer or encouragement, let us know how we can help you. But let us make sure today before we leave this building, before we leave this place, before we take one more step in this life, that we make sure we do so in the light of the Lord. All together we stand and sing.